just before I begin, I just I do want to say a word of thank you to Bacheva and Shira. They are the the wizards behind the scenes that have made this thing happen. Um, it's something beautiful and and wonderful to behold how in times of crisis it brings out the best in people, the best in Kala Yisrael. Um, Hashem, in His infinite genius, gave us this platform called technology. So I can sit here in my little bunker here in Yerushalayim or HaKadosh, and you're out there in London, wherever you may be, somewhere in deepest, darkest, gold is green, and Hendon, and other places where I grew up, and you can still see my shadows. And thank you, Batsheva, thank you, Shira, for this tremendous trust. Um, it's an exciting topic. Uh, well, it's actually a very boring topic at first glance, but once we get into it, you'll see it's a very exciting and important and growth-filled topic, which is the topic of what is going to happen to us this Thursday night and this Friday. As you know, every Jewish month is unique and special, meaning as we travel through the Jewish calendar, we go through different months, and each month has opportunities, just like when you travel through space, each country is unique and special and beautiful and has what to see and has what to offer. In the same way as you travel through time, the Jewish months have something extraordinary and wonderful to offer. How do you know what a month is all about? One of the ways to do it is to look what happens when the moon is at its zenith, meaning on the 15th of the month, when the moon is at its fullest and various people um, like probably some of your dads will go to the roof and start howling like wolves because the moon is out. At those moments, you have to stop and think, what is this whole month about? For example, the month of Nisan. We all know the 15th of the month of Nisan is Pesach, so that makes everything easy. That defines the month of Nisan. Nisan is Gematria Nisim. It is the month of miracles. It is the month where Akash Baruch Hu takes care of us. It is defined by the 15th of the month, which is Seder night. Go back a month, the 15th of Adar. What is Adar all about? So look what happens on the 15th. That is the climax of the Purim festival called Shushan Purim. Go back another month. You have two Bishvat. So the month of Shvat, if you want to understand it, look at the 15th. And there you can find out what it's all about. Okay, so let's look at the month of ER. I know that many of you listening, when you hear the word ER, all you can think of is the best friend of Winnie the Pooh. But you are wrong. It is one twelfth of the Jewish calendar. It is the month that we're now right in the middle in. And there's something that we should be focusing on. And to know that, let's look at what happens on the 15th. So the story of the 15th of year is written in the Chumash, Parshas Bahalosacha, the Midbar Peraktes. Let's read the story and see how does this talk to us. Just a quick reminder, the month of year has only got one Yom Tov that is mentioned in the Torah. Lag Ba'imer and things like that are all very recent customs. The only Yom Tov that you have to know that is Midoraisa from the Torah is Pesach Sheni. So what's it all about? I'm going to read you a story. Once upon a time, and I quote, you have Hayu Anashim, Asher Hayu Tmeim, Lenefesh Adam. There were people that were Tomei, they were impure. Bluyochu Lassis of Pesach, and they couldn't bring the carbon Pesach. The Balaturim brings down, how cool is this? Anashim Asher Hayu Tmeim, Lenefesh, the Gematria, Elu Shehaya Nesim, so I figured this out. The gematria actually works. The people that were carrying Yosef's Aron, Aron means the coffin. They were carrying the coffin of Yosef. They were tame. They could not bring the carbon Pesach. And they complained to Moshe Rabbeinu. What do they say? They say two famous words. They said, Anach nefesh, Lama nigara. My dear ladies and everyone listening, those two words are the centerpiece of the centerpiece of today's class, and they are one of the most important two words to remember in dealing with the challenges of life. Lama Nagar literally means, why should we be left out? That's not fair. 
Why should we be left out? And the pastor continues, Lebildi Hikriv is carbon Hashem, the soap in Israel. Everyone else brought a carbon. We also want to bring carbon. We were Tame. This is our problem. Give us a second chance. So Moshe Rabbeinu says, you know what? I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. Let me go and ask Hashem what he has to say. And Hashem in turn introduces carbon Pesach Sheni. Carbon Pesach Sheni, fascinatingly, is the carbon that if Mashiach comes today, which we hope he does, so that is going to be the carbon that we're going to be bringing. But the bottom line is Pesach Sheni. Hashem says, let them have a second chance. Let them bring a carbon called the carbon Pesach Sheni. And with that, it's a substitute for what they missed a month ago. And now I'm going to ask you to think this through and ask a very simple question. What's going on over here? Where else in Judaism, in our wonderful religion, have we heard of a thing called second chance? To God forbid, a person's on a desert island, they missed out on Shabbos. They missed out on Yom Kippur. They missed out building a sukkah. They find out it's over with. And they go to the rabbi and says, well, we missed out on Shabbos. Can we do it on Wednesday? Can we keep Yom Kippur the day after Yom Kippur? Can we build a sukkah some other time in the winter? They're going to look at you and say, Rabino Eloko, you're crazy. You missed your chance. It's over with. One of the things you need to learn about life, you miss your boat. You finished. It's over with. Let me share with you a personal story. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember 9-11. 9-11 was a crazy moment in our history. After that, it became impossibly hard to travel. And there was I in Los Angeles airport. It has the unfortunate name Lax. It sounds like someone with stomach problems, but the bottom line is Lax Airport. I was there when they were training these young men to be able to check suitcases for bombs or what have you. I don't know how the Americans do it. It seems like they collected the biggest group of high school dropouts in the history of humanity. There was something basically backwards with this young man. And he ended up going through my suitcase for over half an hour and I missed my flight. I was supposed to go to Portland. There were a hundred people waiting for me. It was an important gig for me. I wanted to go there. I missed my plane. I complained to the TSA. They said, I'm sorry, it's security. There's nothing we can do for you. It was not security. They were training some person who was half human, half ogre. I don't know what this guy was all about. To this very day, I still get nerves when I go through the TSA. I'm just telling you, Heathrow Airport is a dream. Okay, you go to New York, you go to Newark Airport, there's still a sign there that says, do not put child through conveyor belt. If you want to understand what makes the Brits different from the Americans, no offense, my American listeners, but this is like insane. Who would think to put their child into a conveyor belt? Probably Trump supporters. I don't know who's out there, but you know what I mean? Like, okay, Johnny, um, okay, we're going to put you in over here. It's going to be a little bit like, you know, like a car wash. It's going to be flashing lights. You know, you can do it. And then they say, you know what? Maybe we can squeeze in grandpa. What are they thinking? But somehow or other, I lose out. I miss my flight. I have to deal with these people. I do not get a second chance. Over with Benito. I missed that flight. It was a terrible, terrible day for me. So what do you do? You miss flights. You miss things. What are you going to do? You're just going like, to like cry about it? You move on. That's the secret of life. What happens over here? They told him, Moshe Beis Lama Nigara, I don't, we don't want to move on. We want to move backwards. We want a second chance. What's the whole idea? What's going, what are they trying to ask for? I'm going to ask another question. Why is it that these two words, Lama Nigara, define the month of year? So somehow or other, this month, called the month of year, which is one twelfth of our calendar, and we're going through spheres to Ome. You want to focus on two words in the Torah. It's Lama Nigara. Third question. Third and final question. 
This question is something I saw in the Siva Shalom, the Slana Marebbe. He points out that the words Bayomahu, Bayomahu keeps on appearing in this parsha for no apparent reason. And they came on that day and they said, we couldn't make the Pesach on that day. Who cares on that day? What does Bayomahu have to do with anything? So let me summarize the three questions that I have. They're all basically connected. The main question is what kind of question is Lama Nigara? It is not an intellectual question. It's what you call, it's not the Shaila of the Chacham of Seder night. It's the Shaila of the Tom on Seder night. What kind of question is that? You want a second chance? You missed out? Deal with it? That's life. The second question, why does this define the month of year? It's the 15th of the month, the zenith of the month. And thirdly and finally, what's this Bayomahu, Bayomahu going on in the Parsha of Pesach Sheni, in the Parsha in Bahalosucha that deals with Lama Nigara? Okay, so let's try and understand the month of year from a totally different perspective over here. Uh, I'm going to give you, this is like, um, I guess it's like Kabbalah for dummies. What are you Kabbalah for dummies? My teachers always said, you do not talk about Kabbalah in public. But if something has become so commercialized that everyone talks about it, it's well known. And you have, you know, your art school Kabbalah for dummies. And if you're from Los Angeles, so you can go to the Kabbalah kindergarten and learn these things. These are the Sephiros of your neighborhood off your neighborhood, off your neighborhood. This is what they teach, everyone knows these things, that the 12 months of the Jewish calendar have mystical constellations. And these mystical constellations come with mystical letters and they all somehow connect to understanding the month. So you don't have to be a genius to know that when the sun sets and the moon rises, you look outside, you see once a month, Every month, the, the stars are aligned differently. You connect them, they form different shapes. These are called, in Hebrew, mazoles. Mazoles, in English, constellation. And you have the, the Goyesh mazoles happen to line up more or less with the Jewish mazoles. The Jewish mazoles are very real. They're very powerful. There's a lot written about them. You can learn about your month by understanding the aimet, the depth, of what these constellations are all about. So last week, you had what's called Aries the Lamb. In Hebrew, Mazel Tle. So Aries is, it's a Greek word for a lamb, it's got nothing to do with Wonder Woman. It is a, it is, it is a, a sheep, and a sheep is very much connected to the month of Nisan, as we know, because we brought the carbon pass up. Beautiful. So in the sky, you get to see a sheep. What is the month of ER all about? So look outside and you will see Taurus the bull in Hebrew, Mazel Shor. So we go from the month of the sheep to the month of the ox. What does this mean for us? What kind of a transition is this? Fascinating. Next month, the month of Matan Teres, Sivan, is called Mazel to Umin, Gemini, the twins. So here we go. Sheep, ox, twins. What's going on over here? My dear ladies, I want to teach you something about life. And once you've heard it from me, you'll notice it again and again, these patterns repeating itself throughout your life. And this is how it goes. Hashem has an interesting way how he deals with us. It's called in Hebrew, chesed gevura tiferes, which means Hashem throws us extreme kindness. Everything falls into place. The stars are aligned. Our lives are filled with magic. You just feel like you're in the middle of some Disney musical. And then, out of nowhere, everything crashes. You suddenly find yourself in a world of harshness. You feel alone. You feel neglected. And then, step number three, everything's figured out. It's not exciting like the beginning. It's not harsh. But you're moving on 
in a healthy, balanced way, that's always step three. Let me give you some examples. When you, I tell you what, I, I work in CARE in America, an organization called NCSY. So I don't know what the equivalent would be back in England. I'm a Sinai boy, I grew up in Golders Green. Woodlands Close, to be exact, has of the whole works. And when I was growing up, so we had Sinai Camp, it's not exactly Kirov. It wasn't Kirov then, I don't know what happens now. But in America, they have this frontline Kirov organization called NCSY. You go there and you will see 16, 17 year old girls, boys, never kept Shabbos in their lives. They come and you see that Shabbos, you see in their faces, their faces are glowing with joy. They love the music. They love the fun. They love the new friendships. They love the constant attention from all the advisors. Life is great. By the time they're finished, that's it. They've fallen in love with Shabbos. I'm going to keep Shabbos from now onwards. And all their advisors and friends say, yeah, you can do it. Cheer, cheer. You can do it. They come home. They announce in their homes. That's it. I just had the experience of my lifetime. I want to keep Shabbos. And the parents look at them and say, um, Senorita, I do not think so. This is not going to happen. Not only that, I'm going to prove to you it's not going to happen. This Shabbos, we're going to go and visit grandma and grandpa going by car. You make the decision. You're coming with or you're going to be with your new parent religion. And then their friends suddenly disappear and their friends from school are all saying, you, you're crazy. What are you thinking about? What are you doing? Their advisors have no time and they've moved on to the next crop of kids. Suddenly, they find themselves extremely, completely, totally on their own. It's very frightening. And they have two choices. The logical choice is to go back to their comfort zone. Where were they the day before they went to their Shabbat zone? That makes the most sense. Life was easy. It was uncomplicated. Or they can do something insane. And that is what we call in the language of motivational speakers, you got to jump. Sometimes in life, you got to jump. Jumping is a metaphor. If you're on a plane and you've been trained to be a parachutist, you've never done it before. It's your first time. Let's just say that you're scared of heights and they open up that door. You look out, you say, I can't do it. I just can't, it's too much for me. It is too much for me. It's terrifying, 10,000 feet below. Who knows what can go wrong? And then suddenly a voice inside of you says, I got this, I can do this. And you jump. And the moment you jump, you suddenly realize that the world is beautiful and you feel that you're flying and the world is incredible and everything is falling into place. And it's just the most incredible experience. But that moment when you decided to jump, you didn't do something from your intellect because the intellect was saying no. You did something from your heart. You found something deep down, reserves. In English, we use the word, you found the guts to do something that is intrinsically sounds irrational. Other examples. I know if you're before or after you're in seminary, but when you went to Sam, those of you that went to Sam, how often do you hear the story? You arrive in your new seminary. Everyone's smiling, everyone giving out candy packets, sweet packets and stuff like that. Life is great. You meet your new roommates, people from all over the world. You go to the Kaisal, you go to Yerushalayim, it's a beautiful, your first Shabbos at a beautiful home in Yerushalayim. Life couldn't be better. And then boom, out of nowhere, suddenly things go wrong. Suddenly you realize that that, that you, you will not be able to deal with your new roommate, whatever it is, major, major foot odor or whatever it is that's going to drive you crazy for the rest of the year. You have your first negative taxi experience. You get in trouble with your own holly with the school. You call up your mother and say, mommy, take me home. And mama says, if you want, you can come home. Or you can make the decision to stay. At this point now, again, you've got two choices. You can get on that plane and come home. Or you can become a fighter. You can, I'm going to work this out. I'm going to make this year amazing. And then you get to stage three, where everything's just normal and you have a great year. Just like in my story with the kid keeping Shabbos, 
once she forces herself, after a while she gets accepted, and then Shabbos becomes part of her life. One third example, which you're not going to like. You're not going to like this example, and, and, and maybe it won't happen to you. You know what? Maybe it won't happen to you. I have to tell you that there's probably nothing more annoying than seeing a collar, seeing a girl getting engaged, and especially if it's your daughter, someone you love, your best friend just got engaged. So the moment you get engaged, they turn to this new form of creature that seem to be totally oblivious of the world around them. It's it. I don't know how to say this nicely. They just become like, like oh, everything's, everything's bluffy, and everything's beautiful, and that's it. They have all their support and all their love and they're busy figuring out how they're going to set up home and it's so much fun. And they set up the wedding and then finally you see them under the chuppah. How do they look like under the chuppah? She's a princess, he's a prince. They look so grand and so wonderful and so beautiful. And everyone's dancing around and everyone's taking pictures and everyone's saying how great you are and wonderful you are. Seven days of Shavuot Brachas. The single hardest decision you will make is which shoes will match the outfit. Life is great. It is wonderful. The day after Shevet Brachas, let us be politically correct. Your husband goes off to Kailo. Ah, and you're at home. And there in the middle of your bedroom on the floor are two filthy, rancid, stinking socks you realize his mother never taught him to put them into the hamper. Now what? What are you going to do now? That's it. Welcome to Shana Rishona. Now Shana Rishona does not have to be Gehenim, but it's always challenging. It is not the simple thing that you thought was going to work out. It is so hard. It is a miracle if you don't spend a lot of time crying in your Shana Rishona. These things always happen. But you know what? If you're a fighter and your husband's a fighter and you say, we're going to make this marriage the best marriage ever. It will be that way. And then on your fifth anniversary, you look back and says, what, what we were thinking, this was amazing. And your 10th anniversary and your 20th and your 30th and you go into old age and your best friend and everything's perfect. You have the best marriage ever. But you had to go through chesed, gevura, tiferes. The beauty at the beginning, the harshness that followed, and then somehow things work out in the middle and you move on. That's how Kodesh Baruch Hu runs as well. Everyone should stop thinking about their own lives. You'll probably notice those patterns have already happened in your life. Let's go back to our sheep. Let's go back to our ox. And then let's try and figure out how the twins come next. What are the sheep all about? So, Shlomo Melach says in Shir Hashem, Mashcheni Acharecha Narutza. Dear God, you're our shepherd. Pull us towards you, we'll come running. It's a great feeling. On Seder night, we have what's called in Kabbalah, Hisayrus Galeila. Everything comes down from above down. Everything's perfect. Everything falls into place. You can reach on Seder night the highest madrega with minimum effort. The Hasidic masters say, Anyone who's anyone can reach the level of Ruach HaKedesh on Seder night. He's got to follow the rules. Don't worry. It hasn't happened to me either. But it's there. It's a gift from a Kodesh Baruch Hu. It's a Rusa de la'ela, The gift from above. You're the sheep. The sheep is timid. The sheep is placid. It is passive. The sheep has the shepherd watching her. If she gets lost, she's, gonna, she's not going to survive. But don't worry, you got the shepherd. He'll take care of everything. Daddy's there for you. Big Hashem in the sky is there for us. And then you hit the month called Rosh Chodesh Iyar. The truth of the matter is, it already builds up from the 16th of Nisan called Skiris Omer. But that's already complicated to show the Shilub, how everything fits in. Talk about the month of Iyar. It's the month of the ox. What is an ox? An ox is self-made. An ox is muscular. An ox does not need a shepherd and does not tolerate a shepherd. 
The ox, like we see in the beginning of Parshas Balak, can go deep into the ground and pull things out from its own muscle and through its own strength. Don't mess with an ox. It is more powerful than you. The ox is completely and totally self-dependent, and that's how it finds its greatness. But the truth is, you cannot live your life as a human by imitating the role model of the ox. The ox is the human being that jumps. There's only so much you can do that. There's only so much you can take risks. There's only so much you can be a fighter with your whole environment. And then we get onto the twins. What are the twins? What are they, are they all about? To understand that, we have to go a whole level deeper in understanding what is going on behind the scenes this time of the year. And with this deeper understanding, we can go back to our friends, Lama Nigara friends, the ones that were Tomei, the ones that turned to Moshe Rabbeinu and asked for Pesach Sheni. So let's go back and I'm going to give you a story that I made up. It's a little bit um, twisted, this story. I apologize, but it's going to make the point that I want to make. It's not a Dubna Magazmish Marshal, it's a Menachem Nissel Marshal. So just bear with me. Let's picture a story. Once upon a time, there was a cute little girl. Let's say, I don't know, 10 years old. No, it's probably younger, eight or nine years old. I don't remember what's that age when you're just cute and life is beautiful and you have a daddy, you love your father and your father takes care of you. Every Sunday morning, he goes out with you in the car and they go to the park and then they play in, in whatever it is, in Princess Park, and no, no one goes there. And I used to go, you know, whatever, Cheryl Park, I know these places still exist. Hampstead Heath. Life was good back in the olden days. And you go there with your kite, with the ball, whatever it is. Daddy always buys you an ice cream at the end. Yum! Okay, this is great. Life is good. And that's it. And, and, and during the week, you don't see Daddy so much. He's working, he's got his chavrusas, whatever it is. But Sunday morning, that's your time with your father. And you feel his closeness. And you feel his love. And you feel how special he is. Now everything is just perfect. And then one day, Daddy says, I've got a surprise for you. And you go, yeah, I love Daddy's surprises. What's the surprise? Um, I'm going to get you a bicycle. You're ready to have your own bike. Yay! Okay, so, so, so you go to the local bike store, and, um, and that's it. Daddy says, just don't tell Mommy how much we're paying. Choose whatever you want. Of course, you go for the pink bike with the training wheels, with little tassels, and whatever it is that... Uh, um, whatever is the, the latest fad that you have to have her picture on. Um, my daughter um, back then went through, ugh, I've forgotten her name. She's the, she's the one that looks like she has a brain tumor on her head. Um, the, Dora, Dora the Explorer. There we go. Okay, so I don't know. She takes off, I used to torment my daughter by asking her, how does she take off her t shirt when her head is like, okay, I'm strange. I know that. I apologize. Little Dora the Explorer, that's it, that's it. She is going with her daddy every Sunday morning with her wonderful bicycle, and she's driving along, and daddy is running along next to her, and life is good, and life is great, and everything's falling into place. And in the end, they get their ice cream, and that's it. Nothing is more wonderful than my father. And then one day, daddy says, I have a surprise for you, sweetie pie. The sweetie pie goes, okay, I love your surprises. Daddy puts the bike into the car and they travel out. And suddenly they're in neighborhoods that she does not recognize. And it's becoming like dark and scary. And, and daddy's driving higher and higher up some winding road. Daddy's quiet and she's feeling like creeped out by this whole thing. And they get to the top and she opens up and she sees she sees over there a road that goes like this, okay, all the way down. Daddy's taking off the training wheels from the bicycle. And before she has a chance to say anything, Daddy puts her on the bike, gives her a shove down the road, and screams out, hasta la vista, baby. And that's it. She turns around, Daddy's gone. And she's going down. 
and she's going down to the valley of death. She's terrified what's going to be. And she's going down and she realizes she's got to act fast because if she hits the bottom and doesn't do anything, oh my gosh, it's going to be, you know, little bits of sweetie pie mixed up with the concrete and not a pretty sight. But she has a second choice. She can instantly learn how to ride a bike on her own and she can take control. And this is what she does. She suddenly focuses, she realizes what she, she takes off the handlebars and she says, I can do this. And she glides down, she gets to the bottom and she is an angry young lady. That's it. I'm over with my father. He betrayed me when I needed him most. At that moment then, you know, daddy comes in with a big ice cream, a big smile and says, here I am, you are great, let's go home. And she says, well, not so simple. I'm finished with you, father. I'm joining a biker's gang, this is it. No, no more sweetie pie. I know like, you know, like, like leather from Gehenna and Guy, that's it, I'm finished with this. You, you have let me down when I needed you most. So she looks at him and he says, my dear girl, can I just tell you one thing? Just one small thing. Do you know that I own an invisibility cloak? So that's like a Harry Potter reference. You put on this blanket and you turn invisible. He goes, well, I said, look, I'll show it to you. Look, the moment I said Hasta la Vista, I actually put on that cloak and I was, I was riding next to you and I was so close. You don't even know how close I was. You don't even know how close I was with you every second. There was never a chance you could ever, ever get hurt. And she looks at him and says, you are twisted, my dear father. I'm reporting you to the authorities. You have issues. And then, and then he says, listen, no, 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 no. I need you to understand me, but listen to me carefully. Because what I'm about to tell you now is something that you need to remember for the rest of your life. You can only be a sweetie pie so far. The world does not need sweetie pies. The world does not need passive people that, take, that, are, that are taken care of by other people, people that feel entitled, people who do not take initiative. That's not how you make a great world. The world does not need more sheep. That's not what we need. We need people who are independent, who can take on responsibility, who can see a need and fix it. Because Baruch says to Kla Yisrael, I need a partner in this world. And to do that, you have to find that most important person ever. That person is called yourself. At that moment when you took hold of the handlebars in the marshal, that's the moment you discovered that you had reserves of strength and intelligence and skills that you never knew you had. That moment had to happen to you. So when you got to the bottom, so now we can become partners because that's how we build the world. That's the Aymek. That's the deep, deep, deep idea of how the ox becomes the twins. Who are the twins? Go and look and share a share. Yainasi, Ahabasi, Tumasi. Chazal say Tumasi means Hashem says, you are my twin. Together we build the world. It's like a Hashverosh representing God, turning to Esther representing Kala Yisrael, and saying, Chatzi Amalchus, 50-50, we're going to work this together, we're going to change the world to make it into a better place. So you started off as the sheep, where everything was perfect. You were passive, everything was done for you. And then you went through those moments of aloneness, when you felt abandoned, and then at Har Sinai, you realize there wasn't a single moment when Hashem wasn't there for you. It's just that he had to hide because he needed you to become you, to become the person you're always destined to be. Then at Har Sinai, in the words of Shlomo Melech, Yoim Chasunasa, God's wedding day, Yoim Sim Chasli, with the day of his true rejoicing, his wedding partner is Kla Yisrael. The rejoicing is because it has someone in Klai Yisrael called Klai Yisrael who was made out of the right stuff that together we can bring this world to its final tikkun, the sucking Eilam 
Bumalchus Shakai needs Klai Yisrael to have gone through the ox stage in their life, gone through those moments of alone, those moments of feeling vulnerable, and then finding that strength to take care. And then at Harsinai, Ke'ishachad, Belevachad, we become Knesset Yisrael. And there at Harsinai, there's a wedding day, and we are equal partners. At a wedding, the Kal is not less than the Chasm. And at Harsinai, you've got heaven and earth of the witnesses, you have the flowers are provided for by Gan Eden, according to the Medrash. You have the food being a milchik smorgasbord, as we all know. They had whatever, one says, cheesecake. And that's it. The angels are the guests. It was just incredible. It was a, there was a wedding day, which we had earned through the struggle of Sphira Sa'omer. That struggle of Sphira Sa'omer, if you can summarize it, in two words, those two words would be Lama Nigara. Why should we be left out? Those two words is someone feeling abandoned, someone feeling that it's not fair, and instead of running away, you come to Moshe Rabbeinu and say, we want those madregos that everyone else got with the carbon Pesach, we want that as well. It's not coming from here, it's coming from here. It's that, it's that emotional gut reaction. I need to jump. I need to reach those levels. Moshe Rabbeinu, give us the tools. And he talks to Hashem. And Hashem says, I will give them those tools. It's called Pesach Sheni. It's called Pesach Sheni. Pesach Sheni is the second chance to reach that madrega that everyone else reached a month ago. But this time you did it because you wanted it. You fought for it. You struggled for it. You earned it over here. So, what, before I answer the Hodaya's question, um, uh, the, the, I'm not, this, this, this is just like, I don't know why, carbon Pesach, and um, we don't have carbon Pesach. This year, this kind of burnt over here. It's not so bad on this side. You see over here, now these are the leftovers from our Seder night over here. But actually, the, the matzo tasted pretty good. I have to share this with you. Um, but this is what we have left over here. My minak, this is all we do. Is that on, we keep on the 14th, because the 14th is the carbon. The carbon is where the 15th would be that one month after Seder night. Those are ready, I mean, hogging. In practice, nothing much happens on Seder night. And, uh, on Pesach Sheni, in practice, uh, we don't say Tachnun and Davening. The real, real Pesach Sheni is not the Tfilos you say, it's not the Minog of the Matzahs, it's the thinking about what this day is all about. That there are times in life when you will feel alone. And at that moment, then you need to struggle and fight this through until. Hashem reveals himself and says, don't think I wasn't there for you, but you had to do this on your own. And then you realize how close and how loving Hashem is. And then you can go towards the chuppah, which is what Harsina is all about. I don't think that we are living in particularly normal days. Of course, I'm not a great rabbi, but I do know a little bit of history what we're going through, the challenges that people are going through, we haven't seen this in 75 years. This whole planet is involved in this feeling alone, feeling the need of, of introspection. Today, just by chance, I'm on WhatsApp. I had two students, uh, both of them complained to me about how they feel zoomed out. They can't deal with all this zoom. It's too much for them. And, 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 and they want me to give them chizuk. I had a student from Baltimore who's starting a new chizah group for all the older singles over there who are climbing the walls. It's not easy. And Hashem is taking this long rope and this rope is called emuna, And he's asking us to hold on as that rope is being shaken up and down. Those are not my words. Those are the words of Rabbi Elimelech and the Legends describing what happens before Mashiach. And then 
if you can hold on, so you reach this extraordinary world called Bayom Hahu. Remember my third question back at the beginning of the class. Bayom Hahu. Bayom Hahu. Yeah, Hashem Echad. Shema, Shema, Shema. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Lakin, Hashem Echad. When does that happen? Bayom Hahu. Bayom Hahu is a reference that if you can come out strong, then you are bringing the world to that world called Bayom Hu, the world of perfection, the world where everything is exactly the way that Kesh Baruch Hu wants things to be. So I can't do this for you. Your teachers can't do this for you. Your parents can't do this for you. Looking inside of yourself and finding inner strength in the month of Iyar, ER, there's only one person that can help you, and that's yourself. But guess what? You're ready for this. Guess what? You've got this. Guess what? If you made it into the month of ER, it means that you have to find your inner ox, your inner shark, and you have to learn how to jump. You have to be able to, um, I, whatever your, your demons inside of you that you're challenging with, that breakthrough and feel that you're looking for, that breakthrough in the relationships that you have, those of you who have who are in a home and you're straining to have relationships with parents or siblings, with friends that you used to have and you want to hold on to them. So that breakthrough, don't wait for things to happen outside. Find that breakthrough in yourself. Some of you have other challenges that, that are going to bring you my, my, I was going to bring you my cell phone. That's one of my challenges, to be in control of my technology not let my technology be in control of me. It's a huge challenge, especially today, when your technology is your portal to the outside world, to be able to be in control, that you don't waste time, you don't go to places that you don't want to go. That's an ER moment. That's an ox strength to be able to come out and say, I've got this, but you do have this. The Kishbar who is running as well in this crazy way, you're sort of forced to be in this world. Yesterday, I had a funny thought and I want to share this with you. Yesterday, I went outside and um, I, wear, I was wearing glasses. And I don't know if you know this, but yeah, this is kind of gross what I'm about to do, but yeah, you see this? A little bit when you breathe into your mask, so it creates a steam on your glasses. I was thinking so many people are suffering from foggy glasses. And then I remember that the Hassan Sefer says the most beautiful thing that applies to nowadays. When I'm talking to you, I don't even realize that there's, there's air coming out that is made out of moisture. And those vapors, where do they go? So the Hassan Sefer says a chiddush, an idea. Those vapors actually go up and they fit in to the water cycle of the universe. So I don't know if you learned this in your geography classes, but Chazal say that just like we have all kinds of cycles in nature, I'm breathing out carbon dioxide, and the plants are breathing out their oxygen, in the same way that, that the, the lakes are giving out vapor that go up into the clouds that come down as rain. And what adds to that is my breath. Says the Chasm Sefer, if God forbid you're saying Lashon Hara, you're saying bad things. So you create vapor with negative forces that go up into the higher worlds. They enter into the cloud system and they come down. And those are waters of tumor and impurity that go into the ground and become part of your food, part of your, the, the wheat and the barley and the vegetables, and you eat them. And it creates more tumor and you say more stupid things. And the cycle keeps on going, a cycle of evil. Hashem says, I'm going to break this now. Boom, ka. So what does he do? Because Baruch brings bitzeris, which means famine. He brings no water. Everyone goes into their houses. Everyone starts to turn their mouths into evil mouths, into mouths of beauty with tefillah and crying to Hashem and working on, on, on tikkun apeh and lashon hara. And then suddenly with that, will the good vapors go up and they feed into the system. Hashem says, okay. Now we can bring down the Shefa. 
now we can bring down all the beautiful, beautiful liquid. I just want to share with you something very cool. As I'm talking to you, it just started raining over here. Can you hear? It's pouring as I speak. How cool is that? It's the middle of the ER, and I'm talking to you about the rains, the clean rains coming down. Obviously, we're doing something right. This is like insane. But listen to me carefully. I don't think that people are on a high enough madriga to think about the chasm safer. So Hashem says, okay, here's the deal. Every time you see this, think about the power of your speech and what you're capable of doing. Now I want to finish up this class over here. And I want to empower you. You are now living in times that you kind of wish we could go back to the good old days. Don't. Don't ask to go back to the good old days. Tell the Kosh Baruch I want to move forward to the next stage. I want those good vapors to come down. I want all the beauty to come down. I want Mashiach to come. I want Bayom Ahu. I want that day. Lama Nigara. I want that I should be there to greet the Melch Mashiach, where everything that is possibly beautiful will be in this world, where everyone will get on with everyone else. Everything will taste better. Everything will feel better. The whole world will be the way Akash Baruch Hu wanted it to be. To get there, Akash Baruch Hu needs you to be the ox, to you to find that inner strength, for you to see Lama Nigar. I do not want to live an average, boring life. I want an above average, extraordinary life with Hashem. You say those words, Lama Nigar, Akash Baruch Hu will eventually show himself that loving God that should come. Let's build the world together. And that would be the Bayay Mahu. So I want to give you all from this rain soaked Yerushalayim or Hakadish, I want to give you all a bracha that each one of you who's feeling a little bit on your own to find that inner strength, to become that person that you were supposed to be all along. We don't need more sweetie pies. We need Lama Nigara juice. We need oxen. I give you the bracha, you should find that strength. And through that, let the bracha expand, let the rains come down, let the shefa come out. And the Baruch Hu should give us all that bayoy mahu, with the coming of the Gula, with the coming of Mashiach, bin Hera, bin Amen. Thank you again, Batsheva. Thank you, Shira. Thank you, all my wonderful friends back in England. Kosh Baruch Hu should give you bracha in all directions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I recognize so many of your names, and yeah, I know some of your families. Send so my regards to everybody. All the best.